right, welcome to Occult Topics with the Professor. Now this is, um, this is actually the third installment on our Tarot lessons. <clears throat> and we'll be dealing with uh, the High Priestess. Now, I'm starting to get more regular. I've been progressing on my own. The irregularities have been actually recording. So we're on the high pre. First, let me back it up. How rude. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a cold topic with the professor. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for spending time with me. Uh, this is the Tarot uh, Correspondences Study Group. It's basically my study group I'm just sharing. I'm welcoming any feedback you have on it. Um, thank you for spending your time with me. Uh, any feedback is welcome. Uh, this is essentially for beginners, but if you're advanced, I still welcome the feedback. Um, my goal is to spend one week with these tarot cards. Now I'm making these videos kind of long for people like me. I work a lot of hours. I have access to listen to YouTube, but not watch. So it's not like I can, I would like something I can kind of ride out to when I'm at work. So I always say, man, I wish somebody would just give me some good detailed information longer than 10, 15 minutes. Now I know at the same time, this is going to limit my likes because most people don't have two, three hours to dedicate, but I'm going to do it anyway. So again, thank you and welcome to a Code Topics with the Professor. If you haven't already, hit that like button, subscribe, follow, share. So this is actually the third key in the major arcana, the high priestess. We recently covered last week was the magician. Week before that was the fool. And so just to recap and kind of walk it up, the fool began his journey, his descent into materiality. The entire tarot deck is uh, journaling his journey. And so we see how the fool progressed to the magician card, and we're about to see how the magician progresses to the high priestess. And in my studies, I was kind of blown away how actually the magician is uh, working through the high priestess. So you see that they are definitely interconnected. So let's get a sip of water and we shall begin. Now, normally, I pull up the different books and I'm reading right there so you can get a look. I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm just going to keep the high priestess right there so I can kind of stare at her image. I have her card. Let me get my card. I believe I left it in Robert Wayne. His book. Here we go. Set this right here for me to look at. Got a nice double image. So without further ado, we're going to dive into first. Um, let me get that in. Teach yourself to roll the quick and easy way of Philip Cooper. And so let's see what he has to say about the high priestess. Now, what I plan to do is we're going to do is uh, I really want to show how I research. For those who might be new, I want to give you clues on how you can conduct your research. It's better to have books. If you don't have books, get you the PDFs. If you don't have PDFs, Google it. So here in Philip Cooper's uh, Teach Yourself to Row, the high priestess synopsis, intuition, psychic power, the ability to manipulate other people, inspiration, the inquirer should be guided by intuition. I think it's important that we have that uh, intuition be associated with the high priestess. General description, a priestess sits on her throne holding a robe scroll of Torah. A pillar stands, a pillar stands each side of her, one black with the initial B on it, the other white with the initial J. The crescent of the moon is at her feet and she has a crown on her front. She is the spiritual bride and mother who has knowledge of all things. She is enigmatic and has great power. She knows the secrets of the universe. She controls the very source of life. Now, as we progress, um, 
anybody who's totally unfamiliar, we're going to dive into a lot of the things he just mentioned. Um, the two pillars uh, flanking her on the left and right. Um, the scroll she's holding, the Torah, the crescent moon that's at her feet. We'll also get into uh, her diadem, her crown that she's wearing. And so uh, the veil behind her, which is, there's a lot of dope symbolism. Um, Philip Cooper over here, he gives it the bare bones. So I'm gonna progress beyond this. And let's go to Manny P. Hall's Secret Teaching of All Ages. Let me see, I get that in there. That's right, my left is my right. It's Manny P. Hall's Secret Teaching of All Ages. All right. The second numbered major, tr major trump is called La Papis, the female pope, and has been associated with the curious legend of the only woman who ever sat in the pontifical chair. Pope Joan is supposed to have accomplished this by masquerading in malt attire and was stoned to death when a subterfuge was discovered. This car portrays a seated woman crowned with a tiara surmounted by a lunar crescent. In her lap, in her lap is the Torah or book of the law, usually partially clothed. And in her left hand are the keys to the secret doctrine, one gold and the other silver. Behind her rise two pillars, Jachin and Boaz, with the multicolored veil stretching between. Her throne stands upon a checkered cord floor. A figure called Juno is occasionally substituted for La Papisse like the female hierophant of the mysteries of Seville. This symbolic figure personified the Shekinah or divine wisdom. In the pseudo-Egyptian tarot, the priestess is veiled, a reminder that the full countenance, countenance truth is not revealed to uninitiated man. A veil also covers one half of her book, thus intimating that but one half of the mystery is being comprehended. Now, a lot was said here, and what, what I found, what I realized, I've been listening to Manny P. Hall for years, reading his books, and what I'm finally starting to understand is that Manly P. Hall, although he speaks plainly, he also speaks in layers. He speaks to his listener, which is a rare gift. It's a rare ability to be able to speak to several different people at the same time, and that's something that I've noticed about Manly P. Hall is uh, it's never any things, it's rarely in the things he doesn't say. It's gonna be in the offhand remarks that he does mention. So here, and reading the high priest, I, I underlined a few things. Mainly, his references to the different goddesses associated with the high priestess, Juno, Sabelle, of the female hierophant, Shekinah, or divine wisdom. So what we're gonna do is a little side jaunt and we're going to look up these deities. And I'm gonna use first the Encyclopedia of Ancient Deities by Charles Russell Coulter and Patricia Turner. You know what I need this book? I'm gonna need this book to make sure I reference it the deities. I'm going to reference them as I encountered them in his book because again he, he leaves bread, bread trails you know breadcrumbs so if he listen to them in this, in this order I'm going to research them in that order so let's get down to the good part first being Juno which I found very interesting okay Juno Roman may have been assimilated from the Etruscan deity Uni or Iuno, also known as Hera, Greek, Iuno, Etruscan, Juno is uh, Calestis, Juno, Usina, goddess of childbirth, Juno, Moneta, goddess of finance, Saturnia, daughter of Saturn, goddess of magic, goddess, excuse me, goddess of marriage, protector of women and of children, goddess of finance, goddess of war. Originally, Juno was the goddess of the moon. Later, she assimilated to 
the Greek Hera. She is the daughter of Saturn and the wife of Jupiter. They are the parents of Mars. To me, that struck me as very Kabbalistic because you figure uh, to be the daughter of Saturn, which would place her at Bina, and the wife of Jupiter, which is Hesed, and then the parents of Mars, which would be uh, Gebel, Gebel. So to me, that's clearly Kabbalistic. And so what I'm learning through my personal journey is that uh, the two do not function uh, separately. And by the two, I mean Tarot and Kabbalah. Um, matter of fact, I should pull up a good, I should have an image of Tree of Life in my laptop. I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna keep the high priestess staring at me like I'm staring at her. So if I can show you here, uh, and that light is too bright. Um, well, anyway, the um, Sephira Bina, which is represented by the planet Saturn, the mundane chakra Saturn, uh, that is the third Sephira on the tree of life, and then it's followed by the fourth, which is uh, Jupiter, and so we see that Juno is the daughter of Saturn the wife of Jupiter and the mother of Mars. So that just struck me as very Kabbalistic. So it says here, when Gaul assaulted Rome, her geese gave her warning and she saved the city. Her various epithets are Synexia, Damaduka, Uga, Ugelius, Matrona, Pronuba, that sounds like Pornhub, it's spelled P-R-O-N-U-B-A. And I think that I, I, I'm joking about the sounds like Pornhub, but but sincerely and honestly, I am of the knowing or suspicion or the belief, whatever you want to call it, that a lot of these deities have transitioned over to porn because porn gets a lot of energy. And where else for a, a great mother goddess to kind of rest her game during the this uh, weird time we find ourselves in, but on the point. So, random thought. Nixia uh, and Genesis, Genesis, Genesis. Juno, the bitter enemy of Samel, was said to have struck Samel's son, the wine and fertility deity, Bacchus, with madness. Her sacred animal is the goat and her sacred fruit, the fig. Juno's festival date, is July 7th. She is often shown as a stately woman holding a scepter with a bird on top in one hand and pomegranate in the other. She is associated with Jupiter and Minerva. Minerva, see also Bacchus, Cupra, Hera, Samael, and Tanit. So if you look at this image of the high priestess right here, behind her on that veil, that tapestry between her and whatever lies beyond the higher supernals, uh, the, the the true blinding light of Gnosis, what you want to call it, that veil is decorated with pomegranates and palms, like palm tree leaves. So let's go to the next that was mentioned, Cybele. But there was something to hear mentioned about geese. I'm not going to do a side joint on that, but look it up. Anything related to these these keys, these deities, every everything mentioned is actually a key. And that's what Tarot is called, a key. So let's go to Sabel. And her I found very interesting. Very, very interesting. Sabel. Sabebe. Kubel. Kaibel. Greek. Uh, Phrygian. Um, Asia Minor, known as Great Mother, then to Greece and Rome. Sabel may be derived from the Semitic Gebalia, goddess of Gebal. Again, sounds kind of listed to me. Sounds like Gebera. Gebera would be uh, Mars, even though it says that she was Mars' mother. So we'll see. Or Gedula Chesed. So they still have the same Geb pronunciation. Also known as Agdistus, uh, Beresentia, Gaul, 
Then the many, then 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 my the demony, the demony, the demonus, ma magna matter, Roman magna, Charita Roman ops and rea. And we see she was related. She was a uh, she is a uh, direct correspondence to Hera. But anybody that knows Rhea, her name is the anagram for Hera. So these are all the same gods, goddess that we're discussing here. Um, Earth goddess, healer, builder of cities. I highlighted in my book, Builder of Cities, because she's sitting on that stone, which suggests that she's a builder, which every woman is that's capable of childbirth. Even if she doesn't have a child, she represents the possibility of creation. Protector during war, Cybele was a fertility goddess and goddess of caverns, worshiped as mother of the gods in Figuria and Asia, worship of Cybele, traveled to Greece and Rome. If Cybele began life as Agdistus, her father was Zeus and she was born of the rock Agdos, or she could have been the daughter of Uranus and Gaia, or Mayon and Dindami. Sibel was the mother of King Midas by Gordius, King of Phrygia, Gordius of the Knot fame. Oh, the Gordius Knot, I heard that before. And may also have been the mother of Sabazius, oh, of Dionysus. Hmm. On one hand, she struck well, Dionysus. Okay. Her great love was for Attis, and she was possibly the mother of Corbas, later identified with Corbantis and Sabazias. She made a pact with Attis to remain celibate. He broke the pact to satisfy the terms of his agreement. He had to castrate himself, and that's important. We're going to see why the castration is so uh, interconnected with Sibel. Um. She conducted her mourning period under the tree and all growth stopped on the earth. Zeus promised her that the tree would always re remain green, the evergreen. In another version, Zeus, jealous of Atticus's relationship with Sibel, sends wild boars to rip the handsome young man to pieces. Again, another form of castration, similar to Osiris being chopped into 14 pieces and then Isis being able to find everything but his penis, essentially a castration, right? Um, mm, 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 mm. uh, Cybele's uh, priests, all castrated in her honor or in honor of Attis, were known as the Gali. We'll come back to the Gali because I kind of had a weird intuitive connection about the Gali. Um, Cybele was a healer or protector and she offered immortality to her devotees. Eventually, Cybele and the goddess Rhea merged. She wore a turreted crown to satisfy that she was a war goddess and founder of cities. She was attended by Cor Corbantes and rode in a chariot pulled by lions. Sometimes she held a whip. Whenever I think of a chariot, uh, well, not every time, but always comes to, what always comes to mind is uh, the Mahabharata and Mithras. Um, and then most sun gods are pulled by chariots. So just another sidebar. Um, she was also associated with bees as Cybele forget forget uh, P-H-R-Y-G-I-A, Phrygia. She bears branches in her hands and was associated with the sacred column. We see here that the high priest is associated with two sacred columns. Cybele identified with Rhea, Demeter, and Bonadea. Cybele's legends are the same as the mythology attached to the Phoenician mother goddess, uh, Astro, 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 Astrono. Astrono. Compare Cybele and Actis to Ayana and Demuzi, Ishtar and Tammuz. See also Actistus, Ariana, Atlanta, Actis, Corribantus, Curitus, Midas, Rhea, Sabazius. Then we're going to look up the uh, Shekinah. I have one more book on deities we're going to use to uh, kind of suss out this character. 
which would be uh, the next one I'm gonna pull after. I don't think this one had Shekinah in it. I'm almost certain it didn't. Yeah, okay, no Shekinah. So let me get Judica Illicus, Judica Illis, the Illis. And eventually, I want to get to Marvin G. Walker. So, let's do the same again. We're going to start with Juno. I believe this will be Juno. And we can be up here. And Jay Swine. Juno, also known as Uni. Etruscan and Italian and Latin. Juno is the queen of the Roman region. She is an ancient spirit who preceded the Romans in the area. They may have received her from the Etruscans or one of the Italian tribes. In her earliest incarnation, Juno was the spirit of time. With time, we see the connection to Saturn. She was the daughter of Saturn in charge of organizing the orderly division of time. In this capacity, she rules the menstrual cycle. That's the lunar aspect. And then we saw two in the one mythology where she... Uh, released her cycle underneath that tree of Attis. There she did it daily, but you know. Matron, protector, matron and protector of women, Juno is involved in every stage of female life from first breath to last. Her, her particular concerns are marriage and fertility. Juno epitomizes woman power, whatever the female equivalent of virility would be called. Women are expected to honor Juno each year on the occasion of their birthdays. According to Roman tradition, during the week following the birth, a table laden with offerings honoring Juno was kept in the child in the new child's home. Juno can heal any illness, but is especially associated with those considered women illnesses or anything to do with the specifically female parts of the body, breasts, reproductive organs, et cetera. She bestows fertility or it can help you not get pregnant. If that is your desire. She oversees romance, marriage, menopause, and has the power to fulfill any requests made by devotee. Juno has become identified with Greek Hera. You see how it's kind of interchangeable. On one hand, it's Hera, and next is Rhea. Uh, they're both comprised of the same letters, R-H-E-A-H-E-R-A. -E -E so, um, as if Juno was merely another nation's name for Hera. Myths of Zeus and Hera are recounted with the names of Jupiter and Juno, substituted. Hera and Juno do have many similarities and common concerns. However, they are not the same. Their natures are quite different. Juno was not, a, not an abused, jealous wife. Juno was calm, regal, serene, and usually a very reasonable spirit. She is not as volatile as Hera. And we can see that from her pose right there. She actually has a pretty cold look, like she wouldn't go for none of Zeus's bullshit. Uh, her iconography is depicted as a veiled woman bearing a flower in her right hand, holding an infant in her left. Let's go next to Cybele, which in her book, she uses the name Kybele, K-Y-B-E-L-E. Cybele is C-Y-B-E-L-E, uh, also known as Cybele, Kuba, and Kubaba. Earth's oldest surviving goddess was once a forest witch. Kybele's code is considered Earth's most ancient religion. A clay statue evacuated at Kato Hayat, now in modern Turkey, dated from between six to 8,000 years old, depicts a woman flanked by leopards. It makes me think of uh, uh, Bast, Bastet, Gypsy, uh, the gypsy deity. Uh, some associate Sidori, the sacred harlot, who tends to who tends to bar located at the world's end with Kybele. Uh, Kybele is usually translated as cave, place of caves, or, or cave dweller. And that's important because caves generally represent the, the brain. Um, 
but they can also represent the, the darkness of the womb, returning to the womb. So I, that makes very, very perfect sense. Uh, Kybel and Sibelis are both associated with caves. In prophecy, it is believed that the original Sibyls were Kybel's priestesses, although at least some eventually became independent practitioners. Legend has it that Kybel was an unwanted child left exposed in the wilderness. Instead of consuming her, the leopards and lions who discovered her raised and nurtured her, a leopard serving, a leopard serving as her wet nurse. It brings to mind the, the Roman myth of Remus and Romulus being suckled by wolves. It's always a reoccurring theme. Uh, basically to say that she has control over the elements of nature, more importantly, her animalistic nature. Uh, Kubaba became a witch so powerful she evolved into an immortal goddess. In her oldest manifestations, Kaibel is a deity of healing, witchcraft, fertility, women, and children. Rites were held in forests and caves. It's going on here. It up screen. Okay, uh, rites were here to held in forests and caves and included ritual possession, ecstatic dancing, intoxication, music, and sacred sex. She is closely identified with Dionysus and with Kate, who hails from her neck of the woods. Before her arrival in Rome, Kybele was associated with women, slaves, and the poor, not the elite, and already bore a somewhat dangerous reputation. In 204 BCE, the Romans fetched Kybele in the form of a, of a meteor from her shrine at Pisinus in central Turkey. And that meteor is critical. Not so much to the high priestess, but in the over, overall, uh, over the arch of this archetype because we know that meteors fall from the sky. They're essentially stone. She's wearing the moon. Uh, and it goes on to say that she's associated with uh, the Black Madonna, according to that rock. The Oracle of Delphi had forecast that Rome would never defeat Hannibal unless Kybel was brought to Rome. The Romans traced their descent from refugees from Troy and Anatolia now modern Turkey. And so basically the Oracle was instructing them to go fetch mom to get them out of trouble. Kybele was brought to Rome in, tri in, in triumphant procession in 202 BCE, as the Oracle predicted, Rome defeated Hannibal. The black fisted, the black fist sized meteor became the face of a silver statue and must have resembled some black Madonna statues. The Romans combined Kybele's mythology with that of the Greek earth goddess Rhea, so that now it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish between the two spirits. In Rome, Kybele's rites evolved. Secret rituals once performed in hidden caves and forages, forests, 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 now occurred in public streets during processionals attended by thousands. So this is our time to shine. By Roman law, women could not be chief officiators of official state cults, so men assumed positions of authority in Kybele's Roman cult that had been previously assumed by women. Now, this is where I had to, the miniature download, I guess you call it. Kybele was served by priestesses and by transgender clergy known in Rome as Gali, singular Gala, or Galas, literally hen or rooster. And what he struck me was the spelling of the word Gala, G-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Um, I realized that we have things like the Met Gala, and uh, we see that in, in the early 200 BCE, these galas were essentially uh, functions like the Met Galas and the celebrity shindigs we see today, but they were attended to by essentially transgender men men who castrated themselves and portrayed themselves as women to gain the goddess's favor. The only reason why I say I took it as a download, for me, it makes sense. 
everybody's looking at what's going on today in terms of uh, gender fluidity and, and whatnot. And they feel like this is something brand new to the world and, you know, could endanger the repopulation of the human race. And I'm totally, I'm just like, the human race doesn't need anybody's help. Not in that area. Not in terms of being fruitful, multiplying and becoming many. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. And by under the sun, I mean under temporary. A lot of people always call out when they see these Met Galas and these men are dressing in, they have on dresses and they're dressing feminine. We see now that the origin of a gala is in honor of Cybele. Cybele didn't really allow men to tend to her. So men who felt compelled, they castrated themselves and dressed as women. I just thought that that made sense to me. Um, to join the gala, self castration to join the galley, self-castration was required. The galley dressed and lived as women. Kybele's clergy were also skilled medical practitioners through surgery. Replica vaginas, caves, were crafted through which the galley could engage in sacred sexual rituals. So yeah, they got out. <laughs> they got out. And you got to remember that uh, America is essentially trying to mimic Rome which I don't think is a good thing because the Roman Empire, as great as it was, it didn't, it didn't last an eternity. I forget how many hundreds of years, but definitely didn't last that long, which doesn't bode well for America being, what, a couple hundred years old. Cabell's festivals became notorious. Men would suddenly be seized by the spirit and feel compelled to castrate themselves on the spot using uh, pot shards, terracotta, earth, so that Kybele, will, Kybele, who may be understood as earth personified, is the knife herself. The detached organ was flung aside. The house that he hit was considered blessed. Its owner was expected to purchase the ritual wardrobe of the new gala. Oh, wow. Let me hear this stuff. To me, it's like, really? If a severed penis slapped against the side of your house, it was a blessing, and then you had to buy this, this fool a fit. You had to buy my outfit. So, yeah. Be thankful that you got the problems that you have today, because you could have these kind of problems. Uh, Kybele's primary myths, or at least those that survived, also involved castration, death, resurrection. It became a scandalous faith and was periodically suppressed. With the advent of Christianity, serious efforts were made to eradicate her religion. Among other reasons, the early church despised Kybele for the prominence of women, homosexuals, lesbians, and the transgendered in positions of authority. Now that part has changed, uh, recently at least. It used to be a lot of pushback, but now you see all these politicians and clergymen, they're all pushing for the code of Kybele to return more or less. Um, in urban areas, her devotees included a high percentage of men, intellectuals, and the elite, but she was also extremely popular among the poor classes and so was perceived as strong competition for Christianity. Her religion was brutally suppressed in 397 CE, St. John uh, Chrysostom, Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, uh, circa 347, September 14, 407, led what would today be described as a death squad through Fergiria, located in the mountains of what is now Western Turkey, targeting devotees of Kybele. Emperor Justinian, circa 483 to 565, despised Kybele and ordered her remaining temples torn down and her priestesses in Gali murdered. Her sacred texts were buried, although her veneration was widespread. None of Kybele's temples remain. Various ruins may be visited in Turkey. St. Peter uh, Basilica in the Vatican was built directly over her temple, which would explain the resurgence in my opinion. And, I, and like I say, these, these deities, these energetic archetypes, they come in cycles. I mentioned earlier, I said, well, maybe she's hiding out at, at Pornhub. No, she has lesser people to do that work. We see that she is directly tied into the Vatican, uh, to the Vatican 
and basically what we see currently going on, uh, I won't say so much in the world, but definitely in America. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica and the Vatican was built directly over a temple. Parts may survive under the foundation. Some believe that her sacred meteorite is buried there too. Now, let's see, what else do we have on her? Okay, now let's look up the Shekinah or divine wisdom. So that's another correspondence for the high priestess. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Shekinah, the bride of God, the Sabbath queen, Mother Zion. In traditional Judaism, God is not male. Instead, the creator encompasses a male and female side. The name Shekinah derives from the root word meaning to dwell. The Shekinah is the indwelling divine presence. Excuse me. She may, she may be simultaneously understood in several ways. She is the female aspect of the creator. She is the bride of God. She is an independent goddess. In esoteric Judaism, the Shekinah was the bride of Yahweh. The Jerusalem temple was their home, the holy of holies, their bedroom. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, we're going to skip to the manifest. I just had a random thought uh, about the Holy of Holies being the bedroom between uh, Yahweh and the Shekinah. So it says here, I love Judith Gillis' books because she gives you a lot of uh, ways that you can tap into these inner energy arch archetypes. And again, when meditating on this card, uh, Maybe you're working with it, whatever you're doing, you can use these books as references. Uh, you can clearly, if you're working on a specific goal, you can place uh, this card on your altar. You can create an altar just for her. You could work with her, work with this card through the, either Shekinah, Kybel, or Juno. So you have all these options on how to get results. I think that's the most important part is getting results and you want it to impact your consciousness you don't want to have uh, an instance where you're just reading to be reading or a case of intellectual masturbation that's what you don't want now the next book i'm going to jump into will be let's do this arthur a.e wait a.e wait this is his book, The Pictorial Key to the Tarot. Now, in this, we're going to read what he has to say about the high priestess. This is actually his card up here. This is his rendering. Him and I believe is Pamela Coleman. Uh, my heavy hitter is a Paul Foster case. I'm, I'm more partial to Paul Foster case, but we're going to see what uh, A.E. Wade has to say. Uh, the Pictorial Key to the Tarot 2 the high priestess. She has the lunar crescent at her feet, a horn diadem on her head with the globe in the middle piece, in the middle place, and a large solar cross on her breast. The scroll in her hands is inscribed with the word Torah, signifying the greater law, the secret law, the second sense of the word. It is partly covered by her mantle to show that some things are implied and some are spoken. She is seated between the white and black pillars, J and B of the mystic temple. And the veil of the temple is behind her. It is embroidered with palms and pomegranates. The vestments are flowing and gauzy. Uh, gauzy will suggest like almost see-through, but not quite. And the mantle suggests light a shimmering radiance. She has been called a cult science on the threshold of the sanctuary of Isis, but she is really the secret church, the house which is of God and man. Kind of got that from the description of the Shekinah. She represents also the second marriage of the prince who is no longer of this world. She is the spiritual bride and mother, the daughter of the stars and the higher garden of Eden. She is, in fine, the queen of the borrowed light. But this is the light of all, 
She is the moon nourished by the milk of the supernal mother. Supernal mother would have to be Bina. In a manner, in a manner, she is also the supernal mother herself. That is to say, she is the bright reflection. Because remember, she's also a representation of the moon. And the moon reflects the light of the sun. So we see here that uh, Sabelle is, uh, she represents the number two, that duality, that uh, uh, the reflective surface of the moon and then even the darkness of the moon, which is going to come out later. I forget which one of these books, but Sabelle is associated also with Artemis the Hunter. And Artemis is fierce. Artemis, I believe, is the sister of Mars or Aries. So we see that she has this dualistic nature. Actually, she has three natures. If you look, she's flanked by the pillars, but she herself is in the center, making her the middle pillar. So she would have three aspects. It's like there's three major phases to the moon, uh, waxing, full, and waning. So, yeah. Uh, it says, in a manner, she is also the supernal mother herself. That is to say, she is the bright reflection. It is in this sense of reflection that her, that her truest and highest name in Baalism, I think he meant to say Kabbalism, but he says Baalism, B-O-L-I-S-M, is Shekinah, in her cohabiting glory. Hmm. Her cohabiting glory would have to be uh, hard, if I'm correct. According to Kabbalism, there is a Shekinah both above and below. In the superior world, it is called Bina. The supernal understanding which reflects to the emanations that are beneath. In the lower world, it is, it is Makut, the world of being. For this purpose, for this purpose, understood as a blessed kingdom, that which it is made blessed being the indwelling glory. I want to read that again. But yeah, uh, if you think about it in the Lord's Prayer, uh, the nine is the kingdom and the glory. The, so these are actually aspects of the high priestess. So I'm gonna read that again. In the lower world, it is Malkuth, the world being. For this purpose, understood as a blessed kingdom that with which it is made blessed being the indwelling glory. And so I think I, I, I touched on it last week uh, a lot of people believe that earth is a prison, uh, I'm trapped here, I didn't ask to be here, but actually earth is just as holy, just as sacred, just as blessed as any other, I'm speaking Kabbalistically, as any other uh, emanation along the tree of life. Actually, if, you, for, if you're familiar with Kabbalah, earth is quarter, it's a circle with the four quarters. And what you notice about that is, where's my, okay. What you notice about that is that earth is comprised of all four elements, just like the four worlds. So I always think of the fact that earth is the place of a thousand things, is anything is possible. Now, what I wanted to speak on real quick was um, something I read in here. Maybe it come back to me. Uh, hmm. Oh, I know what it is. And um, this is Barbara G. Walker's The Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects. Uh, she has in here a good image. If you can show it, oh, this sucks. Uh, oh, there we go. You see that circle with the cross in the center? That represents earth. You notice that same cross is on the high priestess's chest. And we know that Kabbalistically speaking, all the energies that are present on a tree are funneled down through the moon and into earth. So I just, you know, I like to reiterate and say to people all the time that uh, earth is actually not a bad thing. It's just what makes it, what makes it, uh, beautiful as well as horror, horrifying is the fact that polarity exists. And so for, for you to experience happiness, there has to be room for you to experience utter sorrow. 
And another thing that I've been kind of brewing over mentally is that we live in a reality that is of consensus. And so a lot of people don't realize it, but you, you create your own reality, especially when it's a reality of consensus. So you have to be careful what you be mindful of what you consume through your eyes, through your ears, through your nose, mouth, et cetera, et cetera, because it can become your reality. Um, mystically speaking, the Shekinah is the spiritual bride, the just man, and when he reads the law, she gives a divine meaning. There are some, there are some respects in which this card is the highest and holiest of the greater arcana. And I, I understand that to be the from the mere fact that the high priestess as a representation of the moon, she is a reflection of the higher supernals, essentially Saturn wisdom, and that is funneled directly down into the moon. So de depending on which aspect, like we said, she has a dual aspect as well as a, a, tri a triplicity aspect, but either way, uh, these energies are funneled down through her. And so that makes her, like you said, one, one of the most important, uh, it's, you know, in terms of the account, even though, as I'm coming to understand, they each play a major role and they're very interconnected. And it was something in this dictionary of symbols. Hmm, I can't remember what, it had come to me. It's uh, 337, I'm doing good on time. Um, let me see, not there, let's see what is it, let's see I got my books marked up, the good, it's good and bad because sometimes leaving these marks helps me to uh, find where I'm at, the other times it looks like a peacock for the top. Now I wanted to read this section on the veil because behind her is the veil, we see the uh, that veil with the pomegranates and the palms on it. So this is out of J.C. Cooper's uh, An Illustrated Encyclopedia of Symbols by J.C. Cooper. And here on the veil, it reads darkness, the pre-dawn, pre-enlightened state, either cosmic or spiritual, darkness giving way to light, inscrutability, hidden or esoteric knowledge, secrecy, the illusion of the manifest world, ignorance, concealment, the darkness of mourning, but that which conceals can also reveal. And we're told we see that with her holding the Torah, that which conceals can also reveal. Um, where was I? Direct and naked truth can be dangerous. Thus, the veil is also protective, both of the truth and the inquirer. This takes us back to the hermetic path, the path of secrecy, that everything isn't for everybody. Uh, the veil divides the Holy of Holies. Again, we have a reference to the Shekinah. The highest heavens from the holy place, the temple or church on, on earth. So here we see the dual aspect represented by the veil and also on the greater level represented by the high priestess herself. Uh, the veil also represents submission to authority, hence the nuns and brides veil, which also symbolizes sacrifice and death to the old life, since the heads of sacrificial victims were often veiled and garlanded. Hmm. Never knew that's why a wife was veiled to show submission. Maybe there's something to be said about the fact that uh, wives don't veil anymore. Uh, I guess an argument could be made for that. Um, uh, like hats and capes, the veil protects the inner life of the head where the life power resides. It also obscures the personality and allows integration with others as an ancient priesthood. The deity worship was often veiled. Passing the veil denotes degrees of initiation and gaining esoteric knowledge. Blue veils indicate sky gods or goddesses. We see what she's wearing. It's blue to the point of being sky blue. Uh, Buddhist, now here's the Buddhist Hindu uh, 
correspondence, the veil of illusion, Maya. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense also. You just left Hermes a trickster. So if it progresses from magician to empress, the possibility for illusion remains. And remember that, uh, no, she was, that was Gaia. I won't say that she was related to Maya, but that's Gaia. Um, is the fabric from which the phenomenal world is woven, the obscuring reality. Now, for Christian, in, the, in terms of Christian understanding of this symbol, modesty, chastity, renunciation of the world, the division between Jews and Gentiles, which was removed by Christ when the veil of the temple was rent in twain. The, the rude screens in the veil of the ark are of the covenant separating the Holy of Holies from the earthly body of the church. So it's too many biblical references for not to be Kabbalistic. And the veil most likely in the most simplest sense could be the abyss. It could you know, be the abyss. The cross on the altar is symbolically veiled during the period when Christ was in the tomb. The Egyptian court, Egyptian, the veil of Isis, the mysteries of the universe and creation. I am all that has been and is and shall be, and my veil no mortal man has yet lifted. The veil is the universe which the goddess weaves, Proculus. It is the revelation, illumination, and concealment. Greco-Roman, an attribute to Hera slash Juno. Uh, we can stop reading right there if we wanted to. That says it all in terms of uh, the, the actual correspondence, you know. Uh, it is revelation, illumination, concealment. Greco-Roman, uh, an attribute to Hera slash Juno, the veil of the temple and the Ark of the Covenant is the dividing place of the Holy of Holies, highest heaven from the holy place the earth. Its four colors are the four elements. And you look, she has the, the solar cross on her chest. That is also indicative of the four elements. Next, hmm. Let's go to this book. And this book is the Illustrated Signs and Symbol Source Book, an A to Z compendium of over 1,000 designs by Adele Nozador. So let's go ahead and check it out. Let's see what she got going on. So let's get to the High Priestess number two. As the magician, as the magician has the male number, which is the number one, the priestess has the number of the female. Number two, she's sometimes called the Popus. We went through that through Manny P. Hall's book that she's a representation of, of the only female Pope, which is kind of weird to me because the female Pope was stoned. So I'm pretty sure there's a deeper story behind that. Uh, the Pamela Coleman card shows her sitting between the two columns, Boaz female, Jachin male, that are not only the columns of the Kabbalistic tree of life, but also the pillars that were used at the Temple of Solomon and which still influence the design of Masonic temples. Other elements to note in this card are the book or scroll, symbolic of wisdom and the secrets of the universe that she holds. Now you realize that Torah, which is the Jewish Torah, the Pentuart, but Torah is also an anagram for Rota, R-O-T-A, and Rota is a with an anagram for the will of life or tarot. So we see it all coming, for lack of a better pun, coming around full circle. Uh, there is a veil indicating secrets that are revealed only to the initiate, the crown showing heavenly authority, uh, and the throne symbolic of earthly power. The seated posture of the high priestess is reserved for those who hold a position of great power. Apart from Hermes, the scribe of heavens, the only character in heaven who is seated is God. So we see Hermes, God, and the high priestess, almost they get a seat. 
There may also be a representation of the phases of the moon. Anything with three parts symbolizes the triple aspect of the moon can serve the purpose. The triple aspect of the moon also represents the virgin maiden crone. Uh, let me go back. The crown of the prince of the Anything with three parts symbolizing the triple aspect of the moon can serve this purpose. The crown of the priestess sometimes has three layers or in some decks, the symbol may be more obvious. In the Pamela Coleman interpretation, the priestess not only has a crescent moon at her feet, but her crown is in the shape of the Akhet. Akhet um, real quick. I have Hans, uh, Hans Biederman's Dictionary of Symbols. Hopefully he has it, because I don't feel like walking to my room to get the other books on symbols. So hopefully Hans Biederman was about that action, like Jackson, and he included this clearly Egyptian word in here. No, he didn't. All right, let me see if it's in there. It's Encyclopedia Symbols. Okay, Akhet, Akhet. I would hate to have to go dig up my Egyptian, Egyptian symbology. Yes, not here either. All right, let's keep the party going. Um. The Egyptian symbol for the sun coming over the horizon. Oh, the Ak head it must be similar to the uh, Ankh. Uh, that also looks like the balancing scales glyph of zebra, of Libra. Hmm. Oh, because Z Libra is the horizontal line, then the line with the, like an extended omega. So that's the Ak head, okay. The priestess symbolizes a uh, balance between two opposing forces. We see that in her sitting between the pillars. A uh, cross is also a part of the imagery of this card, generally appearing on the breast of the priestess, indicating her sacred status. All right, let's keep the party going. I'm saving Paul Foster case for last. So I think what I read next is Kabbalistic Tarot by Wayne. So, thoroughly in love with this book, thoroughly. The Kabbalistic Tarot, a text of mystical philosophy by Robert Wayne. So 13, the path of Gimel. That's gonna be that on the middle, middle pillar from Kether, crossing the abyss and going directly into Tifereth. The high priestess, the second key, path color blue, you see it. Related sound, G sharp, planet, the moon, double letter, peace, war, esoteric title, princess of the silver star. Again, another uh, moon and feminine re reference. Uh, 32 paths of wisdom. The 13th path is named the uniting intelligence and is so called because it is itself the essence of glory. Keep hearing glory in relation to it. The moon, hold, and netzach uh, form that uh, was known as the astral triangle, and hold is the sufferer of glory. So, this is the essence of glory. It is the consummation of the truth of individual spiritual things. Having just considered the path of the Empress, one of warm enclosure, a literal return to the cosmic womb. Remember, we talked about caves in connection with Juno, and Juno is the correspondence to the high priestess. Uh, and of maternal protection, the path of the high priestess may be somewhat disconcerting. It is as if the Supreme Mother has removed her smiling mask to reveal her true face, which is cold and expressionless, though beautiful. 
all of the material help of the empress has vanished. There is no more illusions, Maya. Uh, we must face the crystalline reality of our own absolute free will, the most difficult task, the mysteries related to crossing of the abyss. So I'm sure the illusory aspect is going down the tree because things come into form, polarity exists, the higher up the tree you go heading back to the supernals, uh, all illusion disappears. Uh, there's no more polarity, there's no more duality. Uh, the paths of Gimel, the high, pre high priestess, Semet, temperance, temperance, and Tau, the universe, may be considered aspects of the same energy which together make up the devotional middle path. This is suggested by the path's colors in that loop, which are indigo, deepest blue, and blue, which is the color of water and of the moon. These three paths all relate to the moon. Gareth Knight describes the path of Tao as the gateway to the inner planes. I've heard that too many times. Uh, and, and those of Semek and Gimel as dark nights of the soul, another phrase I've heard a lot. I can't think of where I heard it, maybe in like a Lovecraft movie or something. Um, the term dark night coined by the 16th century monk, St. John of the Cross, means the desolation and terror that is felt as one is in the middle of the path towards truth, but has not reached the end. Yeah, that, that would be horrifying, especially if not ready to receive that truth or if you're not open to your own truth. This is particularly applicable to the path of the high priestess, which traverses the frightening desert abyss. So this is how we see the correspondence between the high priestess and uh, the letter Gimel. Gimel means camel. Camels travel across distance. Camels are definitely associated with water because that's the only way they can travel those long distances is by storing water in their hump. And that hump could be seen as a uh, phase of the moon too. Uh, as a side note, the camel is known as a de uh, desert serpent. So it also represents Kundalini. Kundalini travels up the spine. Her being in place of the middle pillar, we know that she travels upwards as well as downward. That's why she has so mm, That's why she has those two uh, aspects, a higher and a lower, because Kundalini goes up and comes down. Um, let's see what we'll read. But there is the implication that we may be born across this desert by the forces of the path itself. For Gimel means camel. It is a beast which may carry us on the path, which is at once the longest and the most important on the tree. Um, camels also represent travel. Says she's involved with finances, camels are involved with finances too, because caravans and stuff like that. So it all makes sense. The path is the first to come from the supernal triangle potential to the ethical triangle, the actual. Moreover, it is it, its very position on the tree between God the Father and Kether and God the Son and Tiferet shows it to confer the very highest initiation. This initiation is through that virgin essence, which has been called the lower Hokma. There are correspondences between the path and the Sephira, which can be established by Dramatria. Let's see what the Dramatria reveals. The names Gimel and Hokma both add to 73. But more important is the idea that wisdom is alternately expressed as masculine or feminine. Mm. The, word is, the word is feminine in most languages, though applied in the Hokma to the quality of primary maleness. To say that the high priestess is the lower Hokma is to say that as the one expands outward, the seed of expansion contains the means of its own limitation positive and negative, self-restricting, self-limitation. Then as Crowley put it, the first and most spiritual manifestation of the feminine takes to itself a masculine correlative by formulating in itself any 
any geometrical point from which to contemplate possibility. The concept, the concept is an impossibly difficult one. And here, more than in other cards, we are faced with the fact that the terms most descriptive of these principles may seem totally nonsensical. Yeah, again, it's the polarity, it's the opposites. So the common description of the key is more approachable. That being the high priestess is the most pure essence of consciousness symbolized in the, in the tarot as the very source of all water. Because that's another thing that you realize about the high priestess card is that her flowing robes is the beginning of all water sources throughout this deck. Almost every writer on the tarot has found such keys to has found such keys to keys in the high priestess. She is often, in fact, described as the inner mysteries or esoteric or esotericism as opposed to the hierophant who is sometimes identified with exoteric religion. I wanted just to point some out that he, he made a pun. She is a key there. What he said here was almost every writer on Tarot has found such keys to the key. Of course, the high priestess, the Tarot cards are known as keys. Um, keys are key in a lot, masculine, feminine. Keys of themselves are, uh, I guess, masculine, not guess, they are. What I found interesting was that uh, the keeper of the keys were, I believe it's the Latin word janitor. Those are the keeper of the keys. And so, uh, it's, it was like a marriage of these two. Uh, let me look it up. I'm gonna read it instead of just paraphrasing. But it was like a marriage of the two. It represented male and female, which is what the cross represents. That uh, uh, horizontal line is the feminine, and the vertical line is the masculine. I'm trying to find key. I know I read it in here. It kind of struck me. Let me leave myself no. Oh, I did. Probably did. Let's see. Be sure I left myself some some breadcrumbs in the form of sticky notes. That's the pomegranate, which I will read. This is the U of the wand. Mm. Let me read this on water before I get to the key. Uh, it says here under water, there was an odd parallel to the sequence of, sequence of the tarot cards, greater secrets, greater secrets trumps. When the card of death is followed by a water pouring angel, another card, the star, shows the naked goddess pouring water from her two jars onto the earth and sea. All right, let me see. Oh, here we go, 83 and 140. Knife. Okay, here we go, key. And um, let's read it real quick. The key was a mystical symbol of knowledge about the afterlife long before Christian popes laid claim to the keys of the kingdom. The Egyptian Ankh was viewed as a key of the Nile, both of the earthly river and its heavenly reflection in the star fields of the blessed, the Milky Way. Like the pagan Petra who became Peter, key holding deities could grant a grant or refuse admission through the heavenly gates, which is what the, what Peter holds. 
Peter controls the keys and allow people through the pearly gates. Key holders, gatekeepers, Latin janitors of the celestial mountain, mansions. The goddess Persephone was the original holder of the key to Hades. Then it says, according to the uh, medieval symbolism of the Tarot, it is not the Pope, but the Papess who holds the all important keys. Remember, she's the Papess, she's the female Pope. She holds the keys. That's why he made that pun about there are keys to this key. That's what I believe. Um, where was I? Um, the high priestess must be studied in terms of the magician in that she carries out what he initiates. Remember with the magician, it was said that the magician is actually in motion. He's doing, and this doing is carried out in the preceding key of the high priestess. This interaction can be discussed in a number of terms, she can be called the root matter, and he the first matter, prima materia. You have to remember too that in Greek, the word matter means mother, which I think is very profound. Uh, however, it may be symbolized. The magician symbolizes a condition prior to unconscious thought. This condition acts upon the high priestess in such a way that the gimel path becomes the mind capable of carrying the thought forms of which the universe will eventually be composed. She is the source of the vibratory pattern of the universe, which underlie everything. Thus, the Crowley card shows a figure composed of waves of energy under which are the mental forms affected by those waves. Moreover, nothing can grow in the garden of the Empress without the underlying structure of energies. The wisdom of the high priestess is in regulation. This is where the keys and finances come in. Um, her fluctuating rates of vibration established the direction, set the pattern for the first matter, prima materia, which equals philosophic mercury, which equals the magician, as it descends towards a condition of greater density, which is earth. It is for this reason that the moon is attributed to this path. The vibratory pattern, the waxing and waning, and all of its other attributes are found at the most pure source. The moon represents fluctuations, uh, dualities, tides. It is the moon which controls the tides of the waters of unconsciousness. I'm just underlining something here. Because the moon is cold, harboring neither good nor bad. Its potent currents, as the meaning of the double letter Gimel, war and peace. Gimel is a Hebrew double letter, and it, it symbolizes both war and peace. Suggests war and peace. We get to be together. That's the cube in Gwen Stefania, I believe. War and peace. Yeah. Uh, it, it's potent currents as the meaning of the double letter gimel war and peace suggests maybe problem solving or causing, but no matter what the result of the activity the high priest of the high priestess, she herself remains unchanged and corruptible, ever virgin. She is moreover the vessel for all the operations of the supernal triangle. It is within her that the activity of mercury, sulfur, and salt takes place. That's alchemy. You can't get nothing done without the high priestess. Hmm. Uh, she is the united intelligence, an activity which is also related to the four elements. And we know that she, she contains the four elements because of that circle, that cross on her chest. The cross uh, proves the circle. We know it's there by, by mere fact, by the mere presence of the cross. We know the circle is there. So that's the four elements. And it says, uh, we have shown how four paths rising into the supernal triangle, each represent a different element and have suggested that each is an aspect of the Garden of Eden. 
The high priestess, again, is the uniting spirit, that fifth element, quintessa, quintessence, which is symbolized by the uppermost section of the pentagram. To reiterate, hierophant, earth, lovers, air, chariot, water, emperor equals fire, and the high priestess equals spirit. She is also the source of the four rivers of paradise, the Pison, uh, river of fire, the Gihon, river of water, the Hidekiel, river of air, and the Frath, river of earth. The idea, <clears throat> the idea of the high priestess as, as pure vessel is commensurate with the retentive qualities of the camel, an animal which stores water for a long de desert voyage. The idea of the, I'm gonna read that again. The idea of the high priestess as pure vessel is commiserate with the retentive qualities. Oh, the retentive qualities of the camel, an animal which stores water for a long desert journey. This suggests another type of retention, memory. Memory is a, a, a feminine act, not on some racist human type stuff, but if you remember, Isis remembered Osiris. I mentioned Osiris earlier about getting chopped into pieces, but it was Isis, the feminine aspect that remembered him. So I get what he's saying. And memories associated with water. Within the high priestess are in fact concealed the memories of the race as well as those of the cosmos. So really any forms of divination have to go to the high priestess because she represents memory. Mm -hmm. Her veil suggests this concealment. In the Golden Dawn card, it is draped around her, covering her eyes so that it is impossible to look directly into her face. The Way card uses a hanging cloth behind the figure, which has the same meaning. But the Crowley High Priestess seems veiled with light itself. He calls her the soul of light in the sense that it is light which conceals the true spirit. This is, this is the light which we have called a fiery darkness and which is the substance of the supernal potential. This is the high priestess in any version of the card understood to be clothed in light. This is the light before the abyss above Tiferet. It is a light so brilliant that none may look upon it who have not become of the same nature. Blinded by light. Um, what is required here is a rethinking of the essence of light. All religions stress, all religions stressing light are based on Tifereth, sun god. These include Christ, Buddha, Apollo, Osiris, Ahura, Mazda, etc. What is important, what is important is that unlike organized religion, the mysteries teach that light does not reveal, it conceals by its very brilliance. Most don't realize that when you're seeking for light, light can be blinded. And again, I'm gonna bring it back to the illusory Maya aspect that there's room not so much to be fooled, but it's based on your vision, your vibration. If you're in alignment with the truth, then you'll see it. If you're not, you won't. The path of the high priestess, like the moon itself, goes from the most brilliant light to the most intense darkness. Thus, the principles of the moon and its deities, Diana, Artemis, and Hecate, apply. Of course, one can choose from numerous variations on the same theme, appreciating that mythology <clears throat> grew out of social needs, uh, that mythology grew out of social needs to a large extent. Yeah, Joseph Campbell kind of touches on the need for mythology in society, so I can agree with that. Uh, thus, we find that Hecate, as described by Hesiod, was the original triple goddess ruling heaven and earth. Later periods concentrated on her more unpleasant aspects as goddess of the underworld and the darker aspects of magic. She remained uh, nonetheless associated with the moon as Hecate Selene, the far shooting moon, an aspect of Artemis. I read these names, especially the Greek names. Oh. 
read these names and I'm struck by, I've seen them all in different fantasy novels, books that I've read and reread. And it is, so I, I actually have an archetype for this in mind already. Uh, Will of Time has a uh, Celine, uh, uh, what's his name? Salvatore, uh, uh, Artemis was the arch enemy of Drizzt Duorden. He was an assassin, strictly about that business, about that action. He was a he. So I read this now and I realize he was actually representing a, a feminine uh, principle. Artemis in one legend, the sister of Apollo and daughter of Zeus, was the bringer of light and the eternal virgin. And we find that the high priestess is called the princess of the silver star. We also are, we, we are also told that Artemis was known as the maiden of the silver bow. So when I hear maiden of the silver bow, I think of Robert Jordan's book, Will of Time. And there was Bridget. She was a hero, like a mythological hero who used a bow. And so, you know, I, the bow represents uh, crescent moons and things like that. Um, Artemis in one legend, the sister of Apollo was to bring your light eternal virgin, uh, made the silver bow. This suggests temperance, the lower extension of the high priestess, which is Sagittarius to Archer. Its arrow may fly heavenward or deeply into the earth. Artemis was also the triple moon goddess, for she was the maiden, then the orgiastic nymph, and then the crone, the old crone. She was all the phases of woman at once. These aspects of the moon are symbolized by the crown of high priestess and weights card. The full moon is shown at the center. The waxing and waning moon represented at either side. So you can see the, the, the different moon phases in her crown. One might well wonder how is it possible for Artemis to be at once eternal virgin and orgiastic nymph, but that is the whole mystery of the high priestess. It is rather like the play Camino Real by Tennessee Williams. Every month by the light of the full moon, an old gypsy woman turns her prostrate daughter, her prostitute daughter back into a virgin which is, as she says, quite a trick. The idea of the high priestess as the uniting intelligence, the reconciler of opposites, is represented by weight as the two pillars, black and white. And she balances them out by sitting in the center, by becoming the middle pillar. Uh, from the supposed Temple of Solomon, they symbolize the union of all polarities, of all polarities, on this path, of which the card number is two. There is, there is the number of reflection and duplication. And as we called upon the affinity symbol of waste magician in the upper, upper extension of Smek, the path of Gimel. To restart our thesis, to restart our thesis, the high priestess acts on the first matter of the magician and causes it to function through the flow of energy. It's totally uh, the high priestess acts on the first matter of the magician and causes it to function in the pattern of the figure eight on its side. One cycle was supposed to be duplicated. Through one cycle is opposed. Oh. One cycle is opposed and duplicated, though the flow of energy is totally unified. That's by the, P, the Ida and Pingala reference, I think is on point. Um, the energy of the magician is held in a reciprocal alternating pattern by that which is called the high priestess. This holding, enclosing, and duplicating function is the first female quality on the tree. In, the, in more contemporary terms, the high priestess is what Jung called virgin anima. Where's my pen at? It says in contemporary terms, 
The high priestess is what Jung called virgin anima, related to the virgin's milk, which he called the life giving power of the consciousness. The alchemically symbolic virgin's milk fed to the stone as the mother's milk is, is fed to a baby. It's synonymous with the water of the high priestess. Hmm. The Golden Dawn and Wake cards both suggest the dispersal of this water from the high priestess. In, Golden Dawn, in the Golden Dawn version, the figure stands upon a moon above wave waves in the weight in the weight version the robes of the high priestess seem to be torn seems to turn into water at its base we talked about that earlier crowley's card is more technical than the others in that it represents a very complicated set of waveforms more than the others his design captures the quality of the top crowley states in fact that his card is very his card is Oh, it's quotation marks. It says Crowley states, in fact, that his card is very peculiarly, peculiarly a glyph of the work of the AA, of the AA. Hmm. In his case, Bolta, in his Bolta course, Tarot Fundamentals case also attaches broad meaning to the card which he explains as a summation of the seven hermetic principles of the Kabbalah. See, I haven't read this book cover to cover yet. I've been cherry picking. So I told myself that uh, once I finish a couple other books on Kabbalah, I want to read this stuff cover to cover just so I can have that understanding for myself. And I know that it's it's overarching. It's not going to apply strictly to Tarot or strictly to Kabbalah. Cases Botakar, a modification of Waits High Priestess, is less evocative than that of the Golden Dawn of Crowley. On the other hand, Waits assist a symbolism is extremely precise. The high priestess is shown as the unifying agent between the two columns of the temple, unification and balance being also represented by the cross on our heart, which Wake called the solar cross. Behind her is the veil of the temple covered with palms and pomegranates. Wake was not very explicit about the reason for the, this choice of plant, of plant forms. Although case, although case says rather unconvincingly that the palms are male or pomegranates are female. Let's check it out. I remember Jesus rolled into uh, Bethlehem on the, on the back of an ass and everybody put the palms down. I had read something, I believe it was. Gerald Massey's Looneology, I think he said that the palms were feminine. I believe they have like something to do like 30 of 30 leaves or something like that. But I believe that uh, in Looneology, Gerald Massey said that the palm was a feminine. And here we see that uh, Wayne expressed uh, his skepticism like that. Oh, well, here it says solar. Uh, Exalt Palm. This is in uh, J.C. Cooper's uh, the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Traditional Symbols. And he states solar exaltation, righteousness, fame, as always, as always growing erect, blessings, triumph, victory, the palm, never shedding its foliage. Hmm. Yeah, clearly phallic. What I'm going to do is, I don't think I have a copy of Looney Odyssey. I think I have it in PDF, but I'm going to go back because I'm going to end up doing a part two to this. Because I'm not going to make it to uh, Paul Foster Cases tonight. Shoot, it's 419. I got shit to do in about two and a half hours. Got to get a little bit of rest. 
So he says here that palms are male while pomegranates are female. Well, according to J.C. Cooper, uh, palms are clearly phallic. So, okay, we'll take that. Still shows a balancing effect. Palms and pomegranates. Pomegranates are indeed uh, feminine in, uh, I believe it was the magician card that we discussed, the pomegranate. Uh, but yes, the pomegranate is a symbol of fertility from the exuberance of their seed. Wade's comments, however, incomplete, suggest another ex examination explanation. He says of the high priestess, she is really the secret church, the house which is of God and man. This implies that she represents all the inner tenets of religion. One might therefore suggest that the palm is a traditional Christian symbol representing the triumph of Christ on his entry into Jerusalem. I just mentioned that, so that's possible. The pomegranate, on the other hand, is associated with the very ancient mysteries. It occurs frequently in the Old Testament and was given special significance by the Eleusian mysteries. Now, I wish I could find some good detailed information on the Eleusian mysteries. Uh, it is therefore likely that Waite intended to convey the idea that the high priestess is the central core, the unifying factor in all faiths, especially Christianity and Judaism. Other aspects of the weight card are more certain. For example, the scroll on which appears the letters T-O-R-A, is the, this is the scroll of law established by the manipulation of the letters T-A-R-O and into R-O-T-A. That's what I said. Uh, tarot as well as rota. Rota meaning will, will of life. It's all the same. It's all the same. And the Latin word for will, this, let me go back and read that. It is also intended to refer to a common, though simplistic manipulation of the letters into T-A-R-O, which is tarot, and into R-O-T-A, which is rota the Latin word for will. This means that the tarot is the law as well as the very will of life. In this regard, it is seen that the Golden Dawn deck, it is seen that in the Golden Dawn deck, the scroll of the law is held by the Hierophant. Hmm. The Hierophant who administers that which is proposed by Bina a scroll in the hand that the high priestess does. Hmm. Read that again. Uh, this means that the tarot is the law as as well as the very will of life. In this regard, it is seen that in the Golden Dawn deck, the scroll of the law is held by the Hierophant who administers that which is proposed by Bina. A scroll in the, and we get it too, remember it was masculine and feminine. So that's kind of locking me in. How could the high priestess uh, represent both masculine and feminine? Because wisdom is regarded as both masculine and feminine. Okay. However, uh, a scroll in the hands of the high priestess does, however, point out that she is the repository of cosmic memory. The Marseille's card is the least interesting of the four, with one exception, which is very little, which is its very title, the female pope. The card is said to represent Pope John, described by Stephen de Bourbon in his 13th century work. As the story goes, a ninth century English girl fell in love with the monk. In order that they could live together, she dressed herself as a man. After the monk's death, she went to she went to Rome and retaining male dress became a priest. Supposedly, she went to Rome, or supposedly she moved up through the ranks of the church, became a cardinal, and was finally elected Pope John the Eighth. She died on the steps of the Saint of Saint Peter giving birth. The story is mythical, but it is important because it is widely believed during the period when the twelve cards appeared. All right. 
I'm going to end up doing a part two to this one later today, today being Sunday. I'm going to do a part two. I don't have much more, but I will, I will go through uh, Darwin's Kabbalistic Encyclopedia, uh, The Unfortunate Mystical Kabbalah, uh, Ophiel's Kabbalah Magic, and I'll dig up some more of the correspondences out of J.C. Cooper's uh, Illustrated Encyclopedia Symbols. I just want to say again, thank you so much for your time. Um, any feedback, please give it to me. Um, if you haven't already, hit that like button and subscribe. And I will be seeing you guys in a few hours after I get a little rest, or more than a few hours. Get a little rest, take care of a little business. So once again, thank you. It's been the, the professor. Thank you for sharing these occult topics with the professor. And like I said, I will be seeing everyone really soon. I guess about, uh, hmm, about six hours, maybe. All right, peace.